The wind from the thermos stirred up a nice sea spray that made a rainbow in the sunlight. Perfect for an Iris message, but our connection was still poor. When Annabeth threw a glow drachma into the mist and prayed for the rainbow goddess to show us to Chiron, his face appeared all right, but there was some kind of weird strobe light flashing in the background and rock music blaring like he was at a dance club. We told him about sneaking away from the camp and Luke and Princess Andromeda and the gold box for Cronus's remains, but between the noise on his end and the rushing wind and water on our end, I wasn't sure how much he heard. Percy, Chiron yelled, you have to watch out for... His voice was drowned out by loud shouting behind him, a bunch of voices whooping up like it was Comanche warriors. What? I yelled. Curse my relatives! Chiron ducked as a plate flew over his head and shattered somewhere out of sight. Annabeth, you shouldn't have let Percy leave camp, but if you do get the fleece... Yeah, baby! Someone behind Chiron yelled, Woohoo! The music got cranked up, subwoofers so loud it made our boat vibrate. Miami! Chiron was yelling. I'll try to keep watch! Our misty screen smashed apart like someone on the other end had thrown a bottle at it, and Chiron was gone. An hour later, we spotted land, a long stretch of beach lighted with high-rise hotels. The water became crowded with fishing boats and tankers. A Coast Guard cruiser passed on our starboard side, then it turned like it wanted a second look. I guess it isn't every day you see a yellow lifeboat with no engine going a hundred knots an hour, manned by three kids. That's Virginia Beach, Annabeth said as we approached the shoreline. Oh my gods, how did the Princess Andromeda travel so far overnight? It's like... 530 nautical miles, I said. She stared at me. How did you know that? Uh, I'm not sure. Annabeth thought for a moment. Percy, what's our position? 36 degrees, 44 minutes north, 76 degrees, 2 minutes west, I said immediately. Then I shook my head. Whoa, how'd I know that? Because of your dad, Annabeth guessed. When you're at sea, you have perfect bearings. That is so cool. I wasn't sure about that. I didn't want to be a human GPS unit. But before I could say anything, Tyson tapped my shoulder. Other boat is coming. I looked back. The Coast Guard vessel was definitely on our tail now. Its lights were flashing and it was gaining speed. We can't let them catch us, I said. They'll ask too many questions. Keep on going into Chesapeake Bay, Annabeth said. I know a place we can hide. I didn't ask what she meant or how she knew the area so well. I risked loosening the thermos cap a little more and a fresh burst of wind sent us rocketing around the north tip of Virginia Beach into the Chesapeake Bay. The Coast Guard boat fell farther and farther behind. We didn't slow down until the shores of the bay narrowed on either side, and I realized we'd entered the mouth of a river. I could feel a change from salt water to fresh water. Suddenly I was tired and frazzled, like I was coming down off a sugar high. I didn't know where I was anymore or which way to steer the boat. It was a good thing Annabeth was directing me. There, she said, past that sandbar. We veered into a swampy area choked with marsh grass. I breached the lifeboat at the foot of a, a giant cypress. Fine colored trees loomed above us. Insects chittered in the woods. The air was muggy and hot and steam curled off the river. Basically, it wasn't Manhattan and I didn't like it. Come on, Annabeth said. Let's just go down the bank. For what? It's there. What is? I asked. Just follow. She grabbed a duffel bag. And we better cover the boat. We don't want to draw attention. After burying the lifeboat with branches, Tyson and I followed Annabeth along the shore, our feet sinking in the red mud. A snake slowly passed my shoe and disappeared into the grass. Not a good place, Tyson said. He swatted the mosquitoes that were forming a buffet line on his arm. After another few minutes, Annabeth said, Here! All I saw was a patch of brambles. Then, Annabeth moved aside a woven circle of branches like a door, and I realized I was looking into a camouflage shelter. The inside was big enough for three, even with Tyson being the third. The walls were woven from plant material, like a Native American hut, but they looked pretty waterproof. Stacked in the corner was everything you could ever want for a campout. Sleeping bags, blankets, an ice chest, and a kerosene lamp. There were demigod provisions too. Bronze javelin tips, a quiver of arrows, an extra sword, and a box of ambrosia. The place smelled musty like it had been vacant for a long time. A half-blood hideout? I looked at Annabeth in awe. You made this place? Thalia and I, she, she said quietly, and Luke. That shouldn't have bothered me. 
I mean, I knew Thalia and Luke had taken care of Annabeth when she was little. I knew the three of them had been runaways together, hiding from monsters, surviving on the land before Grover found them, and tried to take them to Half-Blood Hill. But whenever Annabeth talked about the time she spent with them, I kind of felt, I don't know, uncomfortable. No, that's not the word. The word was jealous.